On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit, with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Zambia, the Latvian region of Kurzem, and the Georgian provinces of Kakheti and Svaneti seem to have very little in common. They lie in Africa, Europe, and on the borderline between Europe and Asia respectively. Kakheti and Svaneti are both part of Georgia, but very unlike one another. So where is the connection? How are these regions similar? There are some similarities, but the main one is that all these places are endowed with beautiful, raw nature. People have not always cared to live in harmony with this nature, but today's trends move more and more in that direction. It's no longer just about taking, but also about giving back, and the natural world is grateful for it. Zambia's history is long and colorful. Human predecessors lived here as far back as several million years. The year 1851 was an important milestone. It's the year when the Scottish explorer, missionary, and doctor, David Livingstone, arrived. He was the one who discovered the world-renowned Victoria Falls. Zambia has long been a part of Northern Rhodesia. The independent Republic of Zambia only declared itself in 1964. It is a poor, typically developing country where AIDS is a huge problem. The average life expectancy is only 45 years, and there are 95 stillborns for each 1,000 live births. The official language is English, but many local regional languages are also used. The capital is Lusaka, with a population of 1 million. Zambia is a true animal paradise, with many representatives of African fauna, thorny croft giraffes, delicate impala antelopes, or buffaloes. The thorny croft giraffes are distinctly different from other African giraffes. Sadly, there are less than 1,000 left. The diversity of life here highlights the intricacy of the ecosystem and the importance of every animal. This is the time to slow down and really look around. The lion is king of the animals here, just like everywhere else in Africa. Even so, the lion is wary of the hippo. There are unique cases when lions have mauled a hippo, but the hippo was usually outnumbered. The lion wouldn't dare attack a healthy, mature individual. The hippopotamus, although a vegetarian and apparently clumsy, is capable of decent acceleration. Hippos are territorial and can be driven to furious rage when their habitat is compromised. The locals claim that whoever crosses a hippo's path seldom gets away alive. The elephants are thoroughly enjoying a morning bath in the wetlands. Nature really is generous to animals in this huge 9,000 kilometer square River Luangwa Valley.
Zambia's natural wealth is striking, and the animals find food everywhere. The majestic baobab tree is a source of a tasty snack. The African baobab is the only one of the eight different baobab trees that grows on the African continent. All the other types, with one exception, can be found only on Madagascar. Somewhere around its middle, the Zambezi River spills sideways. Fifty years ago, the gigantic hydroelectric feat called Kariba was built on it. Zambia shares the energy produced by this hydroelectrical power station with Zimbabwe. The large dam also boasts an abundance of fish. Tigerfish, for example, are renowned and can grow up to respectable sizes. The Tanganyika sardine, or capenta, was moved here from Lake Tanganyika. It's not particularly large, but their population has increased so much over the last 20 years that it has become the staple diet in the region. It's most commonly processed by drying in the sun on dark cloths. Sadly, Zambezi does not only give, it can also mercilessly take. Nicky Rousseau, an ex-auto racer who moved here from Namibia to set up a tourism fishing business, can testify to this. Occasionally, he hunts crocodiles, but only in cases when the particular croc kills a human. Come dusk, he sets out for the hunt, catches the crocodile, guts it, and removes the human remains so that the bereaved have something to bury. In this case, the laws of revenge are ruthless and at the same time provide a kind of justice. On November 16, 1855, during his voyage on the river Zambezi, David Livingstone heard a faraway rumble and saw a high wall of water spray. The deafening noise made him dock at one of the little islands. 
He was stunned and speechless as he saw the river disappear below a nearby edge. I have seen a deep abyss whose opposite bank was rising nearby. The almost thousand meter wide mass of water suddenly fell into a depth of at least 100 meters where all that water had to fit into only a 15 to 20 meter wide gorge, said Livingstone. He remarked that angels must admire such beauty as they fly overhead. He named this breathtaking discovery after the British ruler at the time, Queen Victoria. These waterfalls form a natural border with neighboring Zimbabwe. Such an elemental spectacle is definitely worth visiting over and over again. The water churns in this white stone crevice. As the water falls 120 meters, it first breaks on the stone walls, then hits the bottom so that the water is forced back up again and sprays in all directions. As Forrest Gump would say, rain that flew in sideways, and sometimes rain even seemed to come straight up from underneath. Not all waterfalls are alike. While Victoria Falls are among the largest in the world, this waterfall in Kurzem, a region that's part of Latvia is, in spite of its rather miniature size, still the highest waterfall in this country. It's in the town of Kuldiga, which is the country's most romantic and ancient town, often referred to as Latvia's Venice, thanks to its river, Vetskuldiga. The water here falls from the respectable height of four meters. It then joins the river Venta, on which Europe's widest waterfall lies and is 249 meters wide. In Kurzem, just like the rest of Latvia, we find reminders of the Soviet era literally on every step. Latvia declared its independence from Russia in 1918, but didn't get to enjoy it for very long. In 1940, Latvia was invaded by communist Russia, the Soviet Union. Tens of thousands of Latvians were murdered or dragged off to Soviet concentration camps. Latvia was the Latvian Socialist Republic until 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated. Kurzem forms the western part of Latvia. Its most important area is a cape where the Baltic Sea meets the Bay of Riga. Their battle is evident in the sand. The name of this part of the world comes from the Kur tribe. In ancient times, this tribe was very feared, but in the end, the bloody battles during the course of history wiped them out. In the southern cape of Kurzem, people today strive to undo the sins of their ancestors. Wiping out the yak in the beginning of the 17th century is considered to be one of those sins. Strangely, we're now in the 21st century and the yak is grazing peacefully before our very eyes. How is this possible? The zoologists bred a replica of the former yak and released them, together with the European bison, into the wild near Lake Pape. The return of wild horses is a greater sensation still. They are the reason thousands of tourists flock this way every year. The meadows would have been swallowed by the forest and the ecological balance would have been upset had it not been for these large herbivores. As the saying goes, two birds were killed with one stone. The animals are fed and the meadows are saved. In Kurzem, this is not the only example of a return to ancient traditions. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the vineyard in the town of Sibyl is the world's northernmost vineyard. Wine has been cultivated here since the Middle Ages, and this tradition was revived again in 1989. Should you feel like some Sibyl wine and wish to purchase a bottle, you're in for a disappointment. All of the wine is drunk during the wine festival and none is left to be bottled. The question is, is it so good, or is there so little of it? 
Every present wine cellars, as well as wine made literally in every household, proves that wine production is deeply rooted here. From the Baltic states, we move to the South Caucasus, in this case, Georgia. To be even more specific, we are now visiting the country's largest winemaking region, known as Kakheti. While the winemaking traditions in Kurzem reach back to the Middle Ages, wine has been grown in Kakheti for 8,000 years. It was not that long ago when the locals realized that a fermented grape drink not only tastes great, but also improves the mood considerably. Just about every family grows wine here. Everyone, including relatives from the cities, gladly partake in the harvest. They are all aware that the experience of wine tasting will be well worth it. The yucca plant is one of the reminders of Soviet rule, who grew it for its medical properties. It has remained ever since, and the Georgians seem unable to get rid of it. While the beautiful and fertile vineyards stretch to the Alazani Valley to the 4,000-meter-high Caucasus in the north, the steppe in the south gradually turns semi-arid. Now, we are in the southeast of the Kakheti region, and according to the locals, what we see here is the ocean bottom. They claim that once this was underwater. Now, all that remains are vast and barren steppes. As far as one can see, there is only grass and a few herdsmen. The earth is dry because summer temperatures reach up to 60 degrees Celsius in the sun and about 40 degrees in the shade. The problem is that there really is no shade. Well, maybe here, in the Bear Ravine that was once favored by Soviet filmmakers as a set for westerns. The sheep enjoy the mountains in the summertime, but winters are cruel and they would never survive them. They set out from the north across the whole Kakheti all the way to the southeastern valleys. There is only one road. It is dangerous and has been fatal to many careless drivers. Cattle and sheep are wiser, as they descend into the valley in a well-ordered manner, one herd following the next. Their stamina is remarkable, seeing that they must overcome a mountain pass 3,000 meters above sea level. This is Svaneti, a distinctive region in the southwest of Georgia. The Ushguli village is a symbol of the stubborn and unyielding character of the local people. Today, it is a part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site List. It lies 2,000 meters above sea level, and no one has ever managed to conquer it. Those who tried, failed. 
The stone towers known as Merksvan were mostly built in the Middle Ages. The towers were connected by tunnels, and when enemies arrived, the people simply climbed up with supplies of food and water and removed the ladder. They could last for months, long enough for the enemy to give up. The Mongolians, who vanquished just about everything in the vicinity, also failed. Needless to say, the villagers welcomed the end to a siege and the return to their relatively comfortable homes. There are many jokes nowadays about the stubborn and unyielding character of the local people. One goes, the people will not back away from anything, and so they don't even bother to have a reverse gear in their cars. Mount Ushba is mythical and cruel. With its height of 4,700 meters, it's a real challenge for many mountain climbers. Conquering the top is extremely dangerous. According to Nuksar Nugriani, who has reached the top 11 times, there are three different routes to the top from the side of Svaneti. His sons have followed in his footsteps, and both were lucky. Many others have lost their lives here. Georgians, Americans, Dutch, South Africans, Latvians, and many more. Nukzar helped bring down a total of 25 lifeless bodies. He himself has lost a leg while doing it. It had to be amputated due to severe frostbite. According to ancient legends, Mount Ushba is the home to gods and to the devil himself. In the past, locals were afraid to climb and anger them. The gods' wrath was particularly merciless and cruel. One legend has it that Mount Ushba is actually a petrified boy who was punished for having sinned with a girl named Tetnuldi. She too was petrified and stands across the valley. The summer is drawing to an end, and preparations for winter are in full swing. Supplies of food and wood are refilled, and hay is brought in from the surrounding steep hillsides. The harsh winter will not spare even these birds of prey. The locals are used to severe winters, but even they were taken by surprise years ago when the village became buried under 10 meters of snow and people were killed beneath avalanches. Let's hope the upcoming winter shall be somewhat milder. Good luck, you proud and unyielding folk living by the laws of nature.